thing about water, you know, water and the quality, not just the quantity. Uh, and it's been brought up just a few parts per billion contain aquifers. And uh, we basically, in agricultural society, we're gonna, I think we're going to have to fall back on that when uh, this bubble of cheap, so-called cheap energy that is actually so destructive to all life forms. When methane comes out of the gas, out of the bubbles in water, and then the, from the ground, it's not just a danger because it's explosive. It does not stimulate growth in plants. You know, it stifles the growth of plants. So we're, and then so we're, we're, at, we're at the good, time here, good. so I... Right, one, just one other thing. The volatile quick. organic compounds in the air, that's hardly even mentioned or monitored, you know. Through different cameras and lighting, they can see those uh, chemicals. Please, I think a, a total ban is what we need. You know, on the frontier basins, you use in the northern part of the state. We're we're high elevation. We're at the headwaters of everything. Why would we want to pollute our headwaters? It makes no sense. So please vote on Thank this you. bill. Thank you. One more. Hour. Thank you, Mr. Senator Worth. Me, members. I'm Michael Oney. A couple weeks ago, I was privileged to see Senator Worth and Senator John Arthur Smith stand side by side, proclaiming to the news media for all the state of New Mexico that water is the preeminent issue, the number one concern for everybody to be thinking about. Why is water the number one issue? Because it's about people. I understand about the oil and gas industry. I drove here in a vehicle that needed gasoline and lubricants. I have a house that's warm by a boiler that's fueled by uh, natural gas. I recognize the radical need for that. But I also recognize the need for water for the agriculture industry, another industry, the, the ranchers, uh, the cattle growers in the uh, Clayton area, for example, that are cutting back their herds because of lack of water, the dairy farmers, the safety associations in the irrigation districts in the Doniana County area. This means that a lot of the cotton growers are looking at cutting back their production. That's an industry as well. The chili industry throughout our state. That's an industry as well. Now, I understand about fracking because I've been to places like Wyoming, North Dakota, Texas, Western Oklahoma, and I talked to the people there that embraced fracking because of the economic impact of positive nature. In recent years, I've gone back and talked to those people, and now they're lamenting the loss of their water for their agricultural purposes and also for their drinking water. It's about the people. One quick story, in, in Oklahoma, a year ago this past November, I was in uh, Cherokee, Oklahoma, by the uh, Black Kettle National Grasslands, where fracking is occurring. I was in a diner, and I was talking to the waitress, a single mother with a child, and a truck driver who drove a truck, a big large truck that had drilling liquids technology on the side of the truck. He was in his late 50s. This was a few days after the 5.0 earthquake occurred in Oklahoma. Their concern was contamination of their drinking water. And their concern was their jobs. What are we going to do with our jobs? The waitress couldn't work without the energy worker. She wouldn't have a job. That's people issues. The truck driver, that's all he knew. What's he going to do without the industry? But their number one concern is, what if those casings that go deep inside of the earth are cracked by one of those 5.0 earthquakes, and the water is contaminated. And the truck driver also made the point, since he was, his job depended on moving water, the fracking fluids, where is the water going to continue to come from? Now our agricultural industry, cattle growers, the farmers, that's been around for a thousand years. We have to have it. We have to have food to eat, the fibers for our clothing. We have to have the air to breathe, but more importantly, we have to have the water to drink. Agriculture doesn't exist without water. The human beings, the people, we don't exist without water. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I very much appreciate the presentation. Uh, Kent, do you want to coordinate five? Yes, uh, Mr. President, just a couple of quick things on <coughs> contamination. Um, just for the committee's information, there's not been a, 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 single, uh, a single documented groundwater contamination from, from fracking. Can uh, I make a suggestion, though, before we, because I don't want to, let, let, let's, let, let's let your flag speak, and then we will have an opportunity for, for members, and we can address it. I just think that's a better picture. Yeah. Uh, first, Secretary Venus, if, 
if you wouldn't mind. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee member John Bemis, uh, Energy Minerals, I think our, uh, the Oil Conservation Division is part of our uh, uh, department. I think uh, the information they put in the FIR did a pretty good job of giving some information and coordinating the, the consequences from an economic standpoint. So I, I think what I wanted to say is simply, as the Energy Secretary, I think about this issue a lot, and, and it just continues to befuddle me, and I appreciate that, Senator, you're trying to get educated. The misinformation and, and gap between the two sides is amazing to me. Um, I've been thrown out of meetings before trying to explain some of the facts on, on the industry and, and the thought that there hasn't been contamination. It's been a technology tried and true for 40 years. I would feel much more comfortable if Senator Soles had up there with him New Mexico Tech. And I think that's what I've come to think in terms of the process. For everybody's purpose, we can get people from both sides to sling whatever they want to sling. We really do need education on this. We have the Petroleum Resource Recovery Center is a fantastic academic-based institution. I think they need to be before you. I know they've been here on two occasions to talk about hydraulic fracturing and, and give it from an academic standpoint. I think for the committee's standpoint, when you have 55,000 wells operating in the state, 1,000 to 1,500 new ones a year, 40% of them are through hydraulic fracturing, oil is, is increasing. I think it is important <clears throat> information. It's a dire economic consequence. I know Senator Soles was talking about getting more kids on developmental, <coughs> developmental disability list. We don't have the money for that. So this is a this is a huge important issue. Uh, the protections are in place. Our division does have protections to protect water. Uh, I appreciate the chance to be before you, and, and I do do it and encourage you to get the education that, that, that you can do to make a strong decision on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Art Hall. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Art Hall, and I represent Devon Energy, one of the largest independent oil and gas producers in North America. We operate significant amounts of uh, oil and gas production in the, both the northwest and southeast part of the state. Uh, I think I want to just make a few general comments and be brief. Uh, there are many fine industries in our state, lots of great business. Uh, every single one of them is driven by energy. I mean, we, energy and fossil fuels are the lifeblood of our economy. Any prosperity that New Mexico has today and continues to have is based around this resource. The two most significant financial resources that New Mexico has, you hear them talked about all the time, are our permanent funds. They're the very funds that people want to try to go in now and raid for other uses. Every penny, every dollar that's in those permanent funds was put there by our industry with the help of our brothers in the mining industry. Every single penny, every dollar that we have to run all these programs comes out of those permanent funds. So while there's been a lot of talk about us potentially being the end of civilization for what it is we do, everything in this room that you see and use is a product has been generated through energy, and so it is important. Uh, I think the FIRs are all over the place. There's no doubt that this is literally billions of dollars to our state. And on the point of the amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Payne, there's a, we didn't see the substitute, but there's some constitutional questions. I would ask you to look in Article 4, Section 24 on special use legislation. But I just urge you to oppose this piece of legislation, continue the dialogue around education, and keep supporting our state. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm a registered lobbyist for Chevron. Our, uh, our production is pretty much in the southeast part of the state. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into everything that Art just said because of the, of the time element, but I would ask you um, to, to table this bill. and let, Let's do what maybe Mr. Bemis is talking about and have a bigger, broader education of this issue. Thank you. Uh, New Mexico Business Launch. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Jack Bent. I represent uh, the New Mexico Business Coalition, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. I grew up in the uh, Dallas Fort Worth area, and I've worked in the Permian Basin. And from what I've heard today, I feel very lucky to be alive. 
I'm serious. Uh, if renewable energy was our answer, obviously everybody right now would want to have that. But the truth of the matter is, it's not. We have to have oil production to survive as a nation. And right now, we are producing more than we ever have, and within a few years, we're looking forward to being weaned off foreign oil from the Middle East, which is important to our national security. It is. Two studies I'd like to just quote. In 2010, 30 states showed that no verified cases of drinking water contamination would be attributed to fracking. And just last year, the University of Texas had a study that showed no evidence of aquifer contamination in hydraulic uh, fracturing. So therefore, I strongly urge that this bill not be passed. Thank you. Chairman, I'm Carol Leach. I work for Contract Resources. We're an independent oil producer and operate only in the Permian Basin, so that's Texas and New Mexico. 60% of our production is here. We have more than 200 employees, directly employed by us in the state. This time we're running 12 or 13 grids in New Mexico. Each of those grids runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's another 15 employees for each grid, and probably 200 people to support people with services. This just to give you an idea that this is a people issue. Also. I also want to say <clears throat> we're all suffering from the drought. I'm mm -hmm. one of those people who lives here in Santa Fe. I like it in the garden. That's gotten almost impossible. So with you, I, I can tell you that our company also worries about water. We're a company that has, in the past year, tested eight or nine of the processes of looking for being able to reuse water so that you're not having to use fresh water for fracking. I can't tell you that the technology is exactly there. It's a new technology. It's coming. The industry embraces it as soon as it is really operable. We'll use it, and hopefully part of this dialogue won't have to take place. The other thing that we do is we don't use pits. We've heard all these horror stories about pits. My company does not operate a single pit in this state. Most of the oil companies in Southeast and Mexico do not operate pits in this state. So we've got a lot of red herrings that I wish we didn't have to deal with. Um, we've also heard that this is the end days of the industry. My people don't look at it that way. I suppose it's a glass half full, half empty. My people look at the Permian Basin and they see a future there, courtesy of horizontal technology and fracking, that there will be as much production in the future as there has been in the past. We see what we're talking about here, new oil. We see that there may be other opportunities for new oil outside of the Permian Basin and other parts of the state. We may never know that if we really have more ability to conduct fracking there. Right now, why are we using horizontal wells more than vertical wells? Two years ago, when I first started doing the work private practice for Contra Resources, they didn't run horizontal wells. They actually thought horizontal wells were not as effective in certain areas as vertical wells. We have changed them completely. Two out of our 12 wells are rigs running a vertical. We've done horizontal. Why are we down there? Let's think about the benefits from horizontal wells. One, we use a whole lot less of the surface. That is incredibly important for protecting species that are candidates for being listed on the threatened endangered species list. So less surface. We also use less water. We talked about the increase in the amount of water per well. That is true. But each well that's a horizontal well is replaced with four to eight vertical wells. So overall, overall there is less water than we need. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I really appreciate you both <coughs> presentations today. So let's go through the numbers of the Assembly Board. Yes. Uh, <coughs> We, we're talking, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about water and water usage and water reclamation and it seems to me that, that the technology is there um, and, and from what I understand it, and Mr. Cravens, I'll, Mr. Chair, Mr. Cravens, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Uh, and Senator, I'm sorry, didn't mean to exclude you. Uh, I'm assuming when, when 
we've got a, a, a well board going down, the picture that you showed me. A well board going down, you go down so far, you turn that bit, and you start going horizontally. And now we're going, uh, I'm assuming we're going as, as, as far as a, a quarter or a half mile on the horizontal. Mr. Chairman and Senator, um, typically uh, a horizontal uh, travel will be from a quarter mile to maybe a mile and a half, uh, in, in rare cases uh, up to two miles. And that, that all is a function of uh, the, least surf, the, the least mineral rights uh, and where they are in the setbacks on the, on the surface, uh, the spacing, the well spacing. Uh, th those are all, again, uh, dictated and highly regulated by the OCD. Uh, with lease agreements on the on the front end of the project, and, and uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, so we've got this this horizontal bore, so we're not we're not taking the chance of uh, disturbing as much ground above ground uh, at, at the, the the original site of the well. So now we we've, we've actually had technology to help reduce. The disturbance. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Senator, that's that's correct, and that's one of the benefits of horizontal drilling is that you actually disturb uh, maybe a tenth or an eighth of the surface comparatively with just a straight vertical well. And, and, and what you're doing is you're keeping the production bore in the zone, which can be as thin as maybe 30 or 40 feet, sometimes 150 feet. But the science behind that is, is absolutely phenomenal when you think of keeping a, a bore in, in a production zone that's waving up and down uh, un underneath the surface. So that's, that's what allows us to do that. And, and uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, very, in a, this, this is amazing technology to me. Uh, how do you curve steel pipe? You know, that's, that's amazing technology within itself. And, you know, I know that, that, from what I understand, the process is being put into place how to recycle this water. Mr. That, Chairman, that, Senator, yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is very important. Very important. And, and the only other thing I've got to say today is, uh, uh, and this is going to open up the can of worms, and I hope that, <laughs> that, sir, that you don't take offense at or none of the rest of the group take offense at, but uh, I would like to tell you a story that uh, an archaeologist at Mesa Lens College told me about climate change. And we was, we was touring her, her little museum there, there in Tubacay. And we was looking at all the, the dinosaur bones that they dug out of that area, right in there, and the shark's teeth that was found there. Can you imagine what the climate was at one time around Tupacari in Mexico? You have shark's teeth there. There's no doubt in my mind that the climate was changing. No doubt. And, and I know that sometimes I don't put my thoughts together very well, but I hope that that reaches some of you in, in what I'm trying to say. Man is, is, is and the world is continually evolving. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I think Senator, I'll, I'll be quiet. Thank you. <coughs>
Uh, certainly some of it is a recognition of the amount of money that goes into the permanent fund from those areas and the, the budget problems that that would cause. Uh, I think the purpose of the bill is much more to keep it out of what are called the frontier zones, where we've got most of our watersheds, where you know it's not currently occurring. And so it's recognizing 